Hello everyone. Please welcome our next speaker, Bruce Eckel, who will be discussing about functional error handling. Thank you. Okay, there's a lot here, so I'm gonna, and I have been spending months preparing this thing, so I'm gonna dive right in. Um, so the uh, GitHub repository there has everything here, including the code examples and the little tools that I've created. And uh, there's also a paper that's still in progress, but that goes in depth in things that I'm only gonna be able to touch on here. And I think, uh, I'm, I'm imagining that that might become part of a larger work. And of course, these slides, uh, this talk it require, I mean, it's very heavily uh, dependent upon uh, types. And so uh, you'll see I use types everywhere. And so if you're using this, you'll need to, you know, you need to have a type checker installed. Uh, this, a lot of this work has come from a book that uh, my friends who happen to live in the same tiny town that I do, way up in the Rocky Mountains, uh, and they have these technical chops. Uh, we've been working on this book called Effect-Oriented Programming, and so that's a, that's a much bigger picture. We've been working on it for the last, uh, it's been over three years. And also, I have a podcast that I do with uh, James called the Happy Path Programming Podcast, which I hope you'll check out. And I have to acknowledge ChatGPT, which, as you know, is unreliable, but still very useful. The, my thesis, the thing that has kind of come forward to me recently is that most of what we've been working on throughout the last decades has been uh, composability. And depending on who you look at, this can have different terms, different meanings. And what I mean by composability is simply taking little pieces and sticking them together into larger pieces. And I don't mean that it's possible by contorting yourself to make this happen, which is a lot of times what we have to do, go through a lot of uh, contortions, but um, it needs to be effortless. So you create bigger pieces with smaller pieces, and then those pieces become, we can put those together into larger pieces, and it needs to be fairly seamless. And so what, are the impediments that we have to composability. Uh, initially, there were a lot of assembly language programmers and they just used go-tos to jump around. And in uh, 1968, Ed Edsker Dijkstra wrote this little paper. He never actually mentioned functions in it, but the paper said that it was, many of you have heard of the go-to considered harmful paper. And uh, what that kind of guided us towards was the idea of a function that from the outside has a single entry and a single exit point. And that makes things much more composable. I mean, basically, if you have go-tos, you, you, you don't, there's, there's nothing you can compose because it's just what they called spaghetti code. Uh, another issue was modules. Uh, if you have namespaces, a lot of the original languages had namespaces that were just polluting everywhere. And so there was even a programming language called Modula 2, which its focus was the introduction of modules. And in Python, conveniently, we came up with the idea of, well, the file is automatically a module, so it didn't need all the extra decoration that, uh, say, Modula 2 had to define a module. It was just like, yeah, it's in a file, so it's a module, and the namespace is automatically there. Inheritance, uh, turns out, is an impediment to composability because it breaks encapsulation. And then, finally, the topic of today, which is error handling. <coughs> The uh, error handling has a messy history because when we were starting, 
you were either programming hardware with assembly language or you were using something like COBOL or Fortran and you would take a deck of uh, a stack of punch cards and hand them to an operator and it would come back and it would say, oh, you had an error. So until we started having uh, real-time operating systems that were interactive, we, we weren't really thinking much about, well, what, do you, what happens to an error? Can you recover from it? How do you deal with it? And so uh, people started coming up with various solutions, and they were all pretty messy. Usually they were something global, like you'd set a global flag or you'd send a signal or something, and if somebody else, some other part of your program didn't notice that, uh, it might get overwritten. So we had basically race conditions, and this of course made everything hard to compose because it was, well, it was this global system. A big question was, should error handling be the do in the domain of the operating system or the language? And initially, they thought, well, the operating system handles all the things that we do in common that we don't want to repeat, so let's try it in the operating system. And they included things like resumption. So you had to register error handlers, and, and perhaps uh, if, if your operating system supported resumption, the idea was that you were somehow fixing it in your registered handler and then you'd say resume and it would go right back to the place where the error occurred and hopefully it would somehow magically be able to uh, move forward after that. Uh, anyway, th this did not work and uh, the, those experiments were uh, eventually removed. So when we introduced exceptions, the idea was that, okay, it actually does need to be in the domain of the language, and I would argue that's because it's closer to the problem, and so you have a better understanding of the problem if it's in the language rather than the operating system. So the benefit is that it produced a standard way to report errors. The errors couldn't be ignored as they could if you set global flags or signals or things like that. And in addition, exceptions added the idea that you could recover. And initially, they seemed like a, a good idea, especially in the small, if you were teaching exceptions, it seemed like, oh, this should work. But when we started scaling up and composing things, we started seeing some problems. And probably the main, the biggest part of this is that exceptions are not part of the type system. If you had a type system at all, some languages don't really enforce that, if, and, and of course original Python didn't have any uh, type system. But the problem with it not being part of the type system is that you call a function, there's no information about what exceptions might emerge, and even if you do somehow figure out which ones might emerge, that function could be changed to start throwing new exceptions, and your code would get no notification, you, you get no errors to tell you that, oh, there's, there's a new exception that might show up, uh, you should deal with it. C++ initially, and, uh, and then later Java, they tried creating a shadow type system, uh, the idea of exception specifications, and over time we realized that this didn't work. Java still is holding on to its exception specifications, but C++ actually uh, deprecated its original exception specifications and moved to the system that I'm going to show you today. Uh, Another problem is that it conflates the categories of errors. So we have the idea of, okay, here's some errors that you might be able to recover from. You, you ask for some information from a database or something and it, you don't get an answer and you go, well, maybe if I try again in a second, uh, I'll get an answer. Various kinds of things you might be able to recover from, but then there's a vast number of errors that are simply uh, commonly called panics, and you go, well, there's no way to recover from this, and uh, we just have to you know, somehow record the problem and then bail out of the program. Uh, and exceptions treat both of these things as the same. 
And so you're, uh, it, it, it doesn't make that much sense once you start realizing that they're two different types of things for you to treat uh, unrecoverable errors in the same way as recoverable errors. And uh, which brings us to our first example. One of the other problems is that if you're doing a big calculation, exceptions destroy partial calculations. So this is kind of wasteful, it makes debugging harder. So we can see in this example, yeah. So we can see in, in this example, I've got, uh, I've got a function that has a, uh, it, it, th if you give it the value one, it's gonna throw uh, an exception. It's gonna throw in and, and bail out, so. Um, and then if I have a list comprehension here, well, two of the values are just fine, and it's the, it's the third value, I mean, it's the middle value that throws an exception, but everything gets thrown away. So if you have a big list comprehension or some other big kind of calculation, everything gets thrown away. So uh, this, is, this is not awesome. So how do we deal with that? Well, the f in, with the functional approach, the first thing we do is we stop using exceptions because that destroys everything and has the other problems that I was talking about. Instead, what we want to do is return a structure that combines the answer that we're hoping to get with the potential error that we might get. And one way to do this is with a type union. So if we look here, we, uh, this is a little tool that I've created that you'll see uh, just uh, checks the output. Uh, so that's the validate output. So we have the same function, but now I've added a, a type union, or sometimes called a sum type. So the idea is if the answer is an int type, then that's a successful answer. If it fails, I'll return a string. So you can see that I'm returning a string here. And now, if we uh, produce these inputs, I'm, I'm, uh, I simply uh, create a list comprehension that includes a tuple with the input and, and the result of the function. So you can see that uh, everything works except for the second one, which produces a string instead of an int. And we can do a pattern match on that. And we can say, okay, if it's an int, then we have an answer. If it's a string, then we have an error. And I mean, it works. You can see that uh, we can distinguish between the two, but it's a little uh, unclear to overload a primitive type for the use of this. It, it's, it's, not, it's not as good as it could be. So, what we're going to do instead is create a new return type, which is, uh, which I'll, I'll call a result, and we'll incorporate that. So let's look at the new return type. All right. So we want to make this a generic so that it can be used everywhere. And we will, um, our generic type, which we'll use, we'll create using a type var, will be uh, answer if it's successful, error if it's a failure, and I'll have a base type called result, and I'm making this a data class just because uh, I find those uh, much easier to use, and, and I'm making it frozen because I can. There's no reason to, to modify any of the values here. The base type doesn't contain anything. The success type, which is a subtype of result, and it's based on answer and error, the generic types. The success type only contains an answer, and it can also have, for convenience, it can have an unwrap function, but notice that it doesn't contain the error type. That's only in the failure type, and the failure doesn't have an unwrap, so I can't just take a result that I get back and call unwrap on it. And this is one of the problems that the Go language had when they, they had their convention that looks like this, but it simply returns the struct and the, the recipient can simply 
grab the, the answer and ignore the error if they want. And so that's, that's not a very uh, successful approach. So now what we do is when we reach a point where we have a successful answer, we simply return a success object containing the answer. W if we hit any error condition, we re return a failure object ret uh, holding the failure. And the two are um, distinct from each other. Now will we incorporate this into our example? So here is our function again, but now I'm returning a result, and the, the type on the left will be what my success value will be, and then in this case, the string will be the failure value. So uh, all I do is I say, well, if the value is one, that's, that's, uh, that's a wrong argument, so I will return a failure object, and otherwise I'll return a success object. So now when we, when we um, create this list comprehension and display it, you'll see that, oh yes, here we actually, first of all, everything is a result rather than being a mix of int and string as I had before. Now everything is a result type and the specific subtype of result tells us exactly what's going on here. And so we can see there's our failure, that shows up and everything else is a success. So now what we've done is we've typed the return and we've added more information than, than we've traditionally done with return values. All right, so this is, this is okay. This is, a, this is an improvement. But now we wanna get back to that argument that I was making. We wanna compose. And so we can compose with, uh, and, and now if you were watching, you'll notice that even though I was defining my own result uh, file, I had actually snuck in this returns library, which is this um, library that you can pip install, and it has much more than I'm showing you here. So I'm just showing you the basic things. But now we'll see a little bit more with the returns library. Um, so uh, I'm, I'm just going to bring in my previous func a, and there's different ways that you can use this. Like, for example, here I can actually use the exception as information, but I don't ever raise it. I, n I never throw it or anything. And in fact, you can, we'll, we'll see in a second, you can catch exceptions and turn them into results. So here I say, well, I want to provide the information that this is a value error, but I'll never uh, raise it. So I simply stick it inside of my failure. Uh, here's something where if I give it the value three, I'll end up doing a divide by zero so I can catch the zero division error and then I return it. And notice again, I need to include that in the result. Uh, sometimes they call this the error channel, the second thing. So it's like, oh, this is, I'm returning one of these things. And the, uh, the library also has a decorator that allows you to take an existing function, an ordinary looking function, and by, by adding this decorator, it will uh, actually return the correct result type. So it can see that uh, I'm returning a string here from the function, and it can detect that, oh, there might be a zero division error here. So it, it's going to uh, put that in the result type. Now we finally get to the point where I was trying to get to, which is a uh, composed function. So, um, so what, what I wanna do is I wanna take these functions that I've defined and I wanna put them together into a larger function. So what I'm gonna have to do is in each case, I'll, I call uh, the function, I get a result from it, and then I need to check that result to see if it's a failure. 
If it is a failure, I stop the function, I don't continue, and I, re and I return that result, which I know is a failure object at this point. And I have to do that for each one of these. Now, if, I, um, if, if it gets to this point, then I can call the unwrap on it, and that will extract the result, which I can then pass to func b. And, uh, and then, once again, I have to call this uh, check. And I keep doing this until I finally reach the point where I just, because the result is what comes back from func d, I simply return that result. I don't have to check it. Uh, the, the caller of composed then gets a result, and they're responsible for checking it. And you can see, um, so here are all the different failures that come from the different various um, functions, and there's the division by zero, and then finally at the end we actually get through everything. So you're looking at this going, well, okay, at least I'm covering all the error conditions, um, and notice in the result type we need to create a type union of all the different possible errors to to satisfy the type checker. But you go, boy, this is a lot of noise here, and um, I may uh, forget to do this, or, you know, it's, it's, a bunch, it's a bunch of overheads. So what we can do is there is a function called bind, and I'm going to add the idea of bind to my result type, and what bind does is effectively it does what we were having to do by hand before. You do the is it's, it's check, but this time we say if it's successful, then uh, get the unwrap and pass it on to the next function. So bind simply you what you do uh, what you do is you pass uh, the f you you call bind on a result. See, it's a member function of result and then you pass it the next function that you want to call. And so what it'll do is it'll unwrap the result of the previous call, and it'll pass it to the next function, and then it returns that, and that is also a result. And so we'll see how this, this goes together. And um, if, it's, if it fails, all it does is it goes, oh, well, this is a failure object, I'll return it, and then the next call to bind in the sequence will say, oh, well, that's a failure object, so I'll just return it, and it just returns it all the way out. So it stops the calculation of your composed function and returns the first error condition that it hits. And we see that in the simplification of our composed function. So now we have, here's, here's the first function, and then we call bind, we pass it, the second function that we want to call, the third function, etc. And so after the first function is called, it takes the result, which has a bind method, and it calls bind on it, and that says, oh, is it a success or a failure? If it's a success, I'll call func b. If it's a failure, I'll just return, and then it returns all the way down the line until the result uh, comes back, and that is that the first error condition that it hits. It returns that. And so this is much better because now I don't have a bunch of repeated code. But one of the things you might notice here is that, well, it seems like I'm relying on everything to have a single argument. So what happens if we have multiple arguments? And that is taken care of by um, the library, and I'm not going not gonna to show you uh, the underlying structure of this and just show you how it works. So this is called do notation, and I think it uh, actually originally came from the Haskell language. And so here we have a function that takes three arguments, and what this library does is it overloads, or it kind of hijacked the um, comprehension notation. So what it's doing, I mean, normally we think of comprehension as, well, you've got a bunch of things. All this is, is it's pulling one value out of uh, func A and func B and func C. Um, so you, you, you have to use it in this limited form, but it produces a 
reasonable syntax. So now we can, we can return this function that uh, takes the values from these other functions. And that, uh, that basically solves that problem. So this is just a, an overview of what's the kind of things that you can do. But this is the basic idea. This way we can ensure using the type checker that none of the error conditions that we have in a composed function get lost because the type checker will tell us if, it, if, if that happens. Now one thing I should point out is that this particular library requires, if you, it requires a MyPy extension because MyPy at currently is not able to track all of the errors that, that, uh, that, that happens here. And so they've, they've got an extension. And um, I was not able to get that to work. So just be warned when you look at the instructions and they say, you have to use our extension. I'm not an expert, so there might be something basic that I didn't do. But that's just, that's just a heads up and hopefully uh, at some point that will be rectified. Uh, so, let's see. The, um, if you start looking at other languages, you'll see that this functional error handling style that I'm about, that I've just showed you is happening. It, it came originally from functional languages, but it's happening in other languages. It's built in in Rust. A kind of lightweight version is built in, in into Kotlin, so they have direct language support for this style of functional error handling. And I was very surprised, because I've been out of the C++ world for quite a while, that it's actually um, C++ deprecated its uh, ex exception specifications, and they changed to this style that I've shown you, and that's uh, statically checked at compile time. And so this means that errors are now part of the type system, if you use something like this. So they don't fall through the cracks, and it's, it might be a little early. I mean, there, there needs to be some, some work done on this, but it's significantly better, I believe, to know what the errors are going to be and uh, to, 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 to have to handle them rather than to have to guess or dig into the code to see what exceptions might appear and, and whether you're handling them correctly. Uh, right. So um, for Q&A, because we're down to two minutes at this point, for q and I've, I've booked an open spaces session at 1 p.m. in room 318. And if other people want to meet for dinner, I'm, I'm, you know, with a group this large, I'm rolling the dice here that we can end up with a large group. But anyway, it's worth a try. Uh, meet if folks want to meet for dinner tonight at the Weston lobby at 6:15. Um, I could probably take a question or two in the time that we have left, if there are, are questions. Um, I don't even know how this works. Do we have a, does somebody run around with a microphone? Is that how it works? I'd say arguably one of the benefits of doing this is that you don't have to constantly be worrying about catching an exception in every scope. Um, but you do still have that case, even if you use this for things like um, base exception keyboard error, that kind of thing. So do you have any strategies for dealing with that kind of thing? Yeah, well, oh. yeah, it, it's, Ideally, when you create your library, you include those sorts of things. But the fact that you know Python is as old as it is and it's had all these uh, existing exceptions makes that um, pretty hard for existing things. There, so and new languages that are being developed now, like Rust, for example. When they can build it in, that of course makes a much more seamless experience. Um, whereas with Python, yeah, we're going to have to 
um, still deal with existing exceptions in some cases. And I, yeah, I'm, I'm not really sure how, how we can do anything other than have a mix of, yeah, there's, there's still going to be some exceptions. And some are panics. Some are what, you know, what I call panics, and you can't do anything about that. Thanks. Um, yeah. Unfortunately, we just ran out of time. Thank you. The, yeah, the slides are on the, um, let's see, uh, the, the, let me, yeah, so the GitHub repo, everything's on the GitHub repo.